so Karen, <clears throat> excuse me, so Karen, then in that case, if you're going to set that up, I will get the, um, I'll get the prelude ready. Okay, I think we're just about on. Good morning. Welcome to Sunday morning worship with Claremont Presbyterian Church. This morning, we are, Brian and I, trying to help you feel that you are present in two beloved locations on our campus, uh, in our sanctuary here around the table, and then also in Angel Courtyard, where we often gather around a different kind of table for fellowship gatherings and for Vacation Bible School and uh, other times when our community comes together. So hopefully as you are present with us today, uh, we will sense that we are um, present with each other, even though we can't actually all be here in this place that we love. So let us take a few moments now to open our hearts and find God's presence there and also to sense the presence of one another as our hearts and minds are gathered together for worship this morning.
So good morning. I'm here with my assistant, and we're going to bring to you the call to worship. So let's call ourselves to worship in different places and spaces this morning. Gracious God, in love, you open wide the doors and welcome us into your presence, saints and sinners alike. You spread a table before us filled with the richest fare, a feast of love and mercy for the body and soul. We come with joy to meet you here, to eat and drink at your table, to taste and see your goodness, to celebrate your grace and mercy in our lives. May your spirit inspire our praise and thanksgiving, our prayers and petitions as we worship together in your presence. In the name of Jesus Christ, our host and our Lord, amen. Amen. And now we'll welcome one another to worship in song. Jerry will play this familiar tune for us and we'll sing all three verses of great God of every blessing. Let us continue in worship with our call to and our prayer of confession. How happy are those whose wrongs are forgiven, whose sin is no longer held against them. How happy are those who no longer lie to themselves or to anyone else. When we refuse to admit our sin, it eats away at us little by little, weakening us in body and soul. So let's come before God with our prayers of confession. Let's lay before God the sin that is weighing us down so that we can be freed from its burden and receive God's mercy and love. I invite you to take a moment to sit in silent reflection God, you are our hiding place. Your unfailing love surrounds us, and you fill our hearts with songs of joy. Continue to guide us in the way we should go and watch over us, so that our lives may bring honor to your name. Amen. Amen. And now let us lift our voices in an Alleluia song.
And now out of the abundance of joy in our hearts, let us also open our hearts to Christ's peace. When I say the peace of Christ be with you, I invite you to take time to share peace with one another, either with the people who are in your house right now or with the other people who are online by sharing in the comments or simply by sending a text to someone who's on your mind and saying the peace of Christ be with you. And so, friends, the peace of Christ be with us all now and always. And also, and also, and also with, with you. you. Amen. As you are sharing the, the peace and extending that grace to others, uh, we have been uh, sharing this month of September uh, in the life of our church and our community, different ways that um, people are still continuing to be community for others. And so this morning, we have a um, really wonderful uh, update on our children's center here at the church. And uh, we've put together a little video that uh, Sasha Lord, the executive director of the Children's Center, gives us an update. And we also have some photos. So let's enjoy hearing from Sasha and seeing some of the images. Good morning. I'm Sasha Lord. I'm the director at the Children's Center here at CPC. And I would just like to give you an update date and a thank you for, for being here for us. We have been back in operation since July 1st after closing in March, March 13th. And during that time, we looked at all the ways we could reopen and what that would look like. And there was a lot of support along the way from the church. It was hard for us to be closed and we weren't sure how to imagine sort of coming back from all this. So we had the compensation task force, the reopening task force, a FIAF task force for, for teachers in, in, in need, and all the, and the CPCC commission. All those bodies worked very hard at looking how we would do this, how we would reopen. And that was a huge support. It was a huge support. We, we needed financial help. We needed medical guidance. And that all happened. And then when we reopened, we were ready. We were really ready. The children, I, we were all a little nervous, but the families were extremely thankful. They came in, they needed us, they'd missed us. The children were joyful. The new, the changes we'd made, the new protocols didn't seem to bother them. The teachers in masks, they were fine with. They've just been happy to be back. And the teachers were happy to have some sense of normal again, as was I. The pervasive feeling all through this for me has been gratitude and well and caution, being careful and being staying safe and staying healthy. That was our number one goal. It's still my number one goal. Still, there's been the struggles, there's been financial struggles, and I've gotten a lot of support there from the church. The Mission Commission has been extremely generous and there's been individuals who've been incredibly supportive and kind. And we've needed and relied on that safety net from the church, and it's meant a lot. So in that spirit, that spirit of thankfulness, things have been going smoothly, and I'm happy to say that, that to say thank you. Thank you from all of us. Thank you from the families who really, really need the service we provide, the children who really need each other and the joy that they get in the classroom and, and the peers they have and the teachers here. And thank you for being the church behind us, to be that safety net. So please continue to keep us in your prayers and wave at us from a distance, a safe social distance when you come by. Thank you.
Thank you, Sasha and Pastor Brian and all the teachers uh, for bringing us up to date on the ministry of our Children's Center. Um, as you can see from that video, and as you're about to see, there was actually a lot of um, a really creative ministry happening right now, even though it's less visible than it uh, often is when we're all on campus and seeing things up close and in person. I'm going to invite Jerry to talk to you a little bit about uh, the choir piece that we are about to hear and where it comes from and what it means for our, uh, our ministry over the next months. Thank you very much, Pastor Karen, and good morning, everybody. One of the true joys that I have experienced over the past three years is the opportunity that you as a congregation have given me to attend the annual Presbyterian Choral Directors Conference at Lake Tahoe, which is usually held in early August. Unfortunately, there was no conference this year because sadly it was a victim of the pandemic, as so many things have been. But we're continuing to benefit from some of the connections and the friendships that are, that are forged there. Two of my most trusted colleagues who I've come to know well at this conference are Hugh and Debbie McDevitt. They are a very talented husband and wife vocalist team, and Hugh serves as the music director of the Santa Teresa Hills Presbyterian Church in San Jose. And the two of us have been corresponding, and we came up with an idea. Wouldn't it be great to have some sort of a choral exchange program? And so we, we talk about various, various ways in which that might happen. And so this Sunday is the first Sunday in which this is occurring. Right now, during their worship service, they have been given access to some of our content, including one of the organ interludes that I've done recently. And this morning, we're going to be presenting two of their works from the Santa Teresa Hills Sanctuary Choir. So this is the first, the first effort in hopefully many exchanges we'll be having over the next coming, coming weeks and months. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. It was uh, great to see that. And we will look forward. We will look forward to more of that kind of, um, look forward to more of that kind of exchange in the coming weeks. And we hope they enjoy all the wonderful things that our choir will share with them. Our scripture reading this morning is again from the Psalms as we continue our series on what the poets saw, looking at the lens looking at the world through the lens of the Psalms. Let's continue. This is from Psalm 69. To the leader, according to the lilies, a Psalm of David. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck, and I sink 
in deep mire. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the floods sweep over me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who accuse me without cause. Many are those who would destroy me, my enemies who accuse me falsely. What did I steal? What did I not steal that I must now restore? Oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Do not let those who hope in you be put to shame because of me. O oh Lord of hosts, do not let those who seek you be dishonored because of me. O oh God of Israel, it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. It is zeal for thy house that has consumed me. The insults of those who insult you have fallen upon me. When I humbled my soul with fasting, they insulted me for doing so. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the subject of gossip for those who sit in the gate and the drunkards make songs about me. Answer me, O God, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me, draw near to me, redeem me, set me free from because of mine enemies. Let their table be a trap for them, a snare for their allies. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one live in their tents for they persecute the ones you have struck down and those you have wounded, they attack still more. Add to their guilt. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. But I am low and in pain and let your salvation, O oh God, protect me. I will bring the name of the Lord to praise with a song. I will magnify God with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than a sacrifice. Let the oppressed see it and be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy, and he does not despise his own that are in bondage. Let heaven and earth praise God, the sea and everything that moves in them. For God will save the people and rebuild the cities, and God's servants shall live there and possess it. The children of God's servants shall inherit it, and those who love God's name shall live there. Well, as we continue our tour through the book of Psalms this month, we can't really do a series on the Psalms without stopping for a moment to consider the imprecatory Psalms. Imprecatory, well, what does that mean? I hear you ask. Well, let's get down to it then. The imprecatory Psalms are the Psalms that at some point ask God to curse, punish, condemn, destroy, or otherwise annihilate one's enemies. A lot of Christians who have only a passing knowledge of the book of Psalms are not really perhaps aware that the imprecatory Psalms are in there. And yet there are about 20 of them in the book of Psalms. There are some Christian authorities who would like to keep those Psalms very obscure. The lectionary tends to leave the imprecatory Psalms completely out of the cycle of regular Psalm reading for Sunday worship. And the Second Vatican Council back in the 60s deleted many of them out of the Catholic daily office, deeming them inappropriate for public worship. 
Well, in some ways, I think we can be sympathetic with that. Imprecatory Psalms include raw, angry stuff as we just heard. Certainly not the elevated spiritual language that we associate with worship not the high ethical vision that we associate with Christianity, with the Christian life. In fact, the imprecatory Psalms tend to make nice middle-class suburban Christians clutch their pearls in embarrassment and rush to explain them away. Oh, those, that's just vengeful Old Testament stuff. We don't have to worry about any of that anymore because now we have Jesus. But here's the thing, that Psalm we just read, Psalm 69, that Psalm is quoted 10 times in the New Testament, several times by Jesus himself, most famously when he overturned the tables in the temple courtyard and said, zeal for your house has consumed me. He was quoting Psalm 69. So that old, it's just Old Testament vengeance stuff. We don't have to worry about it. That argument doesn't really quite work. We need to take a look at these Psalms because we may not want to be in such a rush to send these Psalms into the delete file. One scholar of the Psalms has observed, quote, when all is quiet and peaceful in the church and the world, many may not feel very keenly the need for the use of the imprecatory Psalms. In those times, some may study them in a merely detached and academic way. However, when persecution bursts upon the church, when the faith of God's people is severely tried by their enemies, Christians instinctively have turned to these psalms. Some people have considered the imprecatory psalms an offense in good days, but their relevancy is then brought home to them when the forces of evil prosper. This scholar continues, the warfare between good and evil, light and darkness is no holiday entertainment. It is stern and real beyond the comprehension of most of us. And yet it has times when nothing will do but battle hymns like these, close quote. Yes, during times when we are furious at injustice, when we are sick at heart that evil seems to prosper, when we are feeling powerless to change the situation, then the language of the imprecatory Psalms gives voice to our own heaving emotions. Let their tables be a trap for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your burning anger overtake them. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them never be enrolled among the righteous. <sighs> there. That sort of felt good, didn't it? But why? Let's think about that. First, John Calvin has said that the Psalms reveal the whole anatomy of the human soul. And the imprecatory Psalms are proof and testimony that this is indeed the case. If we are to come before God with our whole selves, our whole souls, then anger is part of that journey part of that revelation to God. God knows that we are angry. And until we are honest with ourselves and with God about our anger, the progress of our spiritual journey, our spiritual formation as bearers of God's image and God's blessing will stall out. Our anger will be the elephant in the room when we try to talk to God about more pleasant things. Second, the anger that's expressed in these imprecatory psalms reveals a deep, deep desire for justice and a bedrock conviction that God can and will restore justice, 
where evil and oppression now appear to prevail. Embedded, embedded deep in those angry words of the imprecatory Psalms is an undying hope and faithfulness and conviction that evil will not have the last word, that God will have the last word, that God's righteousness and justice will have the last word. And finally, that hot anger of the imprecatory Psalms is directed toward God. It's not aimed directly at our perceived enemies. In the imprecatory Psalms, we bring our anger, our rage, our disappointment, our desire for vengeance. We bring it to God first, rather than directing it at our neighbor. The imprecatory Psalms are not in fact the comment sections of Twitter, where we spew invective at random strangers on the internet. We take our anger to God, knowing somehow, sensing somehow that God cannot essentially be hurt or scorched by our anger, though our neighbors and our enemies might be. And this wisdom too is deeply embedded in these imprecatory Psalms. This knowledge that if we bring our anger and our rage to God, God can transform it. God can direct our anger for God's purposes in a way that will not destroy those who may be innocent or those who may be not be beyond redemption. If we bring our anger and our rage to God, God can transform it and channel it towards true righteousness. We know that if we bring our anger to God through these prayers, these kinds of prayers, we acknowledge, we're acknowledging that if we skip this step, of bringing our anger to God, if we try to take things into our own hands, we will probably make things worse. Even after the angriest outbursts, the imprecatory Psalms most often end, as does Psalm 69, with a cry that ultimately leaves that anger with God, leaves it in God's hands, acknowledging that the next move belongs to God. Psalm 69 ends, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify God with thanksgiving. That will please God more than sacrifice. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despite, despise God's own that are oppressed. The final words of the song, take anger not into our hands, but leave it in God's hands waiting for God to transform our anger into righteous acts that can be partners with God in bringing justice. The imprecatory Psalms finally trust God to act to transform and restore the unjust situations and to transform and restore us so that we are no longer in bondage to our own anger. Now, I find it interesting that Psalm 69, like some of the other imprecatory songs starts out with instructions to the choir director. Are you listening, Jerry? <laughs> Psalm 69 starts out to the choir master, use the tune, the lilies. I wonder what kind of tune that must have been. Not a happy clappy praise song for sure. Jerry, I wonder, is there a, a, a stop on the organ labeled imprecatory? We really don't know what kind of music this poem was set to, but I'm thinking that it involved a lot of drums, deep, angry drums, and maybe something sitar-like that can really wail in a minor key. What we do know about the imprecatory Psalms is that there is no song that is burdening our hearts, no matter how angry, that we cannot sing it before God, trusting that God and God's righteousness and mercy and justice and compassion cannot tune that song to the music of the universe and the symphony of God's justice and mercy. Yes, let us who seek God
Now let us come before God with our prayers. <laughs> All right. In the, in the same way that uh, Pastor Karen is sharing um, sermons and reflections this month on the Psalms and what the, what the poets saw, uh, I have this love for words and what others have written. And so I found a Prayers of the People that um, expounds and uses and leans on Psalm 19. Uh, you don't have to turn to your Bibles right now to, to look at that. Um, but I will encourage you to do something else while I am sharing this prayer with you. And that is that uh, last week we, we did this practice of making, of encouraging and inviting you to share your prayer requests in the comment section on the Facebook video that you're watching right now. And that really truly is because we are a people called to be in community with one another. That when there are, when we cannot think of what it is that we can do, and it's difficult to think of what we can do, one thing I know that we're called and can do is pray for one another. And so I will encourage you again this week to share your prayer requests in the comments section. Invite your church community to be in prayer and to hold you in prayer together. God, your glory fills the heavens, and all that you have made bears your mark. We pray for this creation. We ask forgiveness for the ways in which we have disfigured it. We pray for those who cannot enjoy the warm sun or the cool night, those who are imprisoned or alone, those who are ill or infirm, those who mourn. Use all of us, our hearts, our hands, to bring your wondrous power into their lives. Let us glorify you, O God. Let your hymn resound in our lives. God, your perfect law protects and revives us, and your way enlightens and enlivens us. We pray for all the peoples of this world, people hungry for order and safety, warmth and shelter, people who lay down their lives to keep their neighbors safe, and those who lead our nations, cities, and towns. Help us unearth this treasure of justice, equality, and equity, and bring it to all the world. Let us glorify you, O God. Let your hymn resound in our lives. God, who brings the true sweetness, the true riches of life to those who serve you, who gathers, protects, and preserves us, we pray for your church. Keep us safe. Keep us strong and faithful. Cleanse our faults, increase our faith, inspire our work and witness in your name. Let us glorify you, O God. Let your hymn resound in our lives. Hear these and all our prayers, great God. And always let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And in the words that Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right. So we have just a few announcements to share this morning. All right. Let's see if I can. Okay. So <laughs> please excuse my, uh, my, my graphic design skills or the lack thereof. But I think that you can see that we are continuing evening prayer on the lawn. Um, we want you to note the uh, time, 6 p.m. And forgive the, the wrong date. That is Saturday evenings. So look to this next Saturday evening. Join us at 6 p.m. on the front lawn of the church if you feel safe and comfortable to do so. If you um, feel in your wisdom that it's best for you to stay home, by all means, please do so, and we will hold you in our hearts and our prayers um, 
and we lift you up in your wisdom. Once again, for uh, this Thursday and then the next, uh, for the next three weeks, our anti-racism reading group will be getting together, and this time we're looking at the podcast, Nice White Parents. So uh, join us on Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. If you need the Zoom link, we have it on the, uh, on the church website and uh, in the latest. And then uh, you can also reach out to Pastor Karen or to me or Shelly Randalls, and we would be happy to get you that, that Zoom link. And then as always, we will have coffee hour immediately following worship today. Uh, please note down this Zoom ID, 975-547-309. It always proves to be a good time to get together, to share updates, to um, address a theme or uh, reflections on what we saw in worship or what we've experienced during the week prior, but it is a great time to gather in this virtual sense that we can at this moment. And the ministries and mission of this congregation uh, continue, and ever so more now is it necessary and important that we uh, find ways to continue supporting those ministries as more people uh, turn to their faiths and their belief systems, as they start wondering and questioning, uh, it is ever more important that we are here for our community. And those are practical needs, those are spiritual needs, uh, those are all community needs. So you can find ways to give online, and that's on our website at claremontpres.org slash giving dash two. And there are a couple options there. And as always, you can mail in um, your offering if you'd like to the church office. Now let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Now we will hear once again an offering uh, from our virtual choir exchange with the church in Santa Teresa. Oh, my. 